Good morning and happy Easter. He is risen. Hey, what's that? I couldn't hear you. Let's try that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, thank you. We got your representatives here this morning. We know you're participating from home and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We wish that we could be with you in person. Oh, we can't wait until we are allowed to gather once again uh, here together. But for now, we do celebrate a risen Savior who is above all of this. He is alive. He's given us newness of life that we may walk in it. Today, we're going to celebrate that. We're going to sing of it. We're going to open up his word and learn of it. We pray that you're blessed today. If you are a newcomer, we want to point you to our connection card. It's on our website right there on the front page. Um, It's in our app, and we would love it if you would click on that at some point during the service or after the service today. Fill that out. Let us know that you've joined us, and let us know how we can best help you and pray for you uh, during this time. Uh, whatever challenges you may be facing, um, and how we can uh, praise God as well for what he's doing in your life. If you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can also indicate that on the connection card, and someone will get in contact with you to talk about uh, who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Let us celebrate our risen Savior. Let's sing together. Nowhere you came to my rescue From the grave I've been raised When I needed a savior to save me Jesus, you made a way I was blind but these eyes have been opened Now I walk in the light Every step on this road I will follow Jesus, you made a way You are the way, you are the way, lost and dead but your love came to find me, Jesus you are the way, you are the way, you are the way, you're the light shining bright in the darkness, Jesus you
again. Happy Easter. Hey, we have an exciting announcement for you this morning. We want to let you know that the recording project is finally complete from the Gospel of John, and those are available for you, SEC people, to download uh, for free. It's our gift back to you. Uh, this is the link on the screen right here, right now, secworship.bandcamp.com. So you can click on that. It'll be on our website as well for you to find. Go there. Um, you click on um, buy digital album. You just put in a big fat zero right there. We want this to be just a gift back to you. All you got to do is put in your email address and then it'll send you a link uh, to download those songs. We're really excited to share them with you. It's been a, it's been a fun an exciting process uh, going through the whole recording uh, project, and, uh, and we think these songs are going to bless you in the Lord and remind you of all the truths from the Gospel of John. So enjoy. Happy Easter for that. As we continue in worship today, I'm going to read a scripture from 2 Timothy 1, uh, verses 8 through 10. It's Paul. He's Paul writing to Timothy. He says this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, see Paul's writing, writing from prison, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, and here it is, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That is good news. Because of the resurrection, you have life. And you see, we couldn't have that without his death. He had, he had to die. He had to die so that he might come to life and that we too might be given new life. That's Easter for you. Let's continue to sing together. Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always there. Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. face tomorrow 
because he lives all fear is gone because I is worth the living just because he lives he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to a scripture for you, Ephesians 1, 18 through 21, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Calling out The living word says come Oh let us hear him speaking loud Salvation song is sung Of oh, the earth Christ did not come The heaven sent of God In fullness of all grace and glory The lonely he will draw
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me and I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bowed in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy storm Messiah still and all Jesus, that we celebrate you, a risen Savior, that we don't simply remember a figure from history that did great things. And there are those that did amazing things in our history that that still affect us today, and yet none of them are alive, and none of them compare to you, Lord Jesus, and what you've done for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus, what greater gift could we be given 
than the very life, your very life. So we praise you, Jesus, our risen Savior today. We thank you that you are with us. You're with us now here in this place. You're with us in our homes and that you transcend all time and space, all these things that that we are limited by here and we feel maybe more sharply right now during this time, but God, you're so above all of that. And we thank you and praise you. I pray for each each family, each person that, that is joining us today in these services and that their hearts would be encouraged, that they would see you as our risen Savior, that they would know you as our Lord. So God, would you do that through your Holy Spirit that works in amazing and wonderful ways, that as we open up your word today and as Pastor Fred comes now to, to speak, uh, that we would hear your voice through your word to us. And it's in the risen name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we, everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, I too want to uh, thank you for joining us on this Easter Sunday. And if you're somebody that is not normally part of the Snohomish Community Church flock, I just want to say a special thank you to you for joining us. Uh, we love it. Uh, we, I hope that you are blessed by what you uh, find here through our music, uh, through the preaching of the word. I recognize going into this Easter that many are feeling the emotional pains and fears related to the pandemic. We've been, we've been at this for a while now, and, and, it's, and it's tiring I suppose the most important thing that I could tell you as your pastor is that Jesus lives. Our Redeemer lives, and through his spirit, he is not practicing any kind of social distancing with you. He is he's near you. Uh, John, uh, in, in Revelation uh, 21, pardon me, John records a vision of our eternal state. And in that vision, uh, we find that even in, in the future, God's not practicing any kind of social distancing. In Revelation 21, verses three and four, I, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. God will dwell with us, he will even wipe the tears from our eyes. Uh, There is no kind of social distancing when it comes to our God and the way that he ministers to us uh, in the future and in in eternity past. Uh, We just saw uh, in the future, let's just take a look at the past. In Deuteronomy 31, verse six, Moses told the people, be strong and courageous, do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you, and that's Deuteronomy 31, verse six. The song is right. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all all fear is gone. The truth that our Redeemer lives has been a source of comfort and joy uh, that began the moment that Jesus was resurrected. And, And in actual fact, the resurrection of Jesus and its powerful implications is, is such a source of joy that even the mere prophecy related to it brought needed comfort and joy. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, it seems that all throughout the scripture, pretty much everywhere the truth of the resurrection is spoken about, there, there is great joy. And our approach this morning will be a little bit different. We're actually gonna be in a couple of different passages. Uh, We'll start in John 8, and then we'll find ourselves in Genesis 2, and we'll have several scriptures to support uh, some of the points that we bring up in both of those passages. 
Uh, For those that prefer, uh, there is a message outline. Uh, It's found on the front page of our website on the message notes links. uh, And I hope that if you use that, you find that helpful. Our passage in John brings us right into the middle of a discussion that's taking place between Jesus and some religious rulers. Uh, These leaders were so put off by the claims that Jesus was making that they actually concluded that he must be possessed by a demon. I guess that's where they went, where when they found that they had no answers. And with that as our backdrop, I just want to invite you at home, if you're, if you're comfortable doing this, stand with us, uh, and let's read in our passage, beginning in John chapter 8, and we'll pick it up in verse 49. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Verse 52, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Verse 54, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And so the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. If you're standing in your living room, you can be seated now. Uh, As the debate went on, as we read, uh, Abraham, the father of the faith, is brought up. He's actually talked about a lot in this one conversation. Uh, Abraham is mentioned either by the religious leaders or by Jesus 11 different times. Uh, That's not so significant except for the fact Abraham's not mentioned by John at any other time throughout the entire gospel. So there's a lot of focus on the father of the faith, Abraham. Uh, The religious leaders, as we get a little bit within, into the conversation a bit, taking a closer look, the religious leaders, they they question Jesus. Let's take a look at one of the questions. In verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who, Who do you make yourself out to be? Well, Jesus replies that he's, he's God's son, therefore he knew God, And they did not know God. They did not like hearing this. And then Jesus said something very, very profound and interesting. And it'll be the focus of our sermon this morning. It's in verse 56, where Jesus says to these religious leaders, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Well, This is an interesting statement, and whatever we have here is certainly amazing. And in in studying this throughout uh, these last several days, I've come to see that the understanding of what Jesus means when he said, Abraham will see my day, and that he did see it, well, it has a lot to do with you, and it has a lot to do with Easter. What did Abraham see of Jesus that made him glad? And is this something that should also make you and I glad? 
Uh, let's approach this issue uh, of what it is that made Abraham glad. What it is that he saw of Jesus that made him glad. Let's approach it by answering some questions. And this will be our outline, actually. I just have three questions, simple. And in answering these questions, I hope that we can come and find some truth that will minister to us today. Uh, question number one. Uh, what was Jesus referring to when he speaks of his day? Uh, let's go back to that uh, 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 verse in John one more time. In verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And in determining an answer, we conclude that Abraham did in fact witness something of Jesus' life. Jesus says so. And the writer of Hebrews actually reiterates what Jesus is saying. And this is in Hebrews 11, verse 13. Uh, Hebrews 11 is that great hall of faith. And we read that these all died in faith. Who are these all? Well, all of these people that are mentioned in the hall of faith. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. And hopefully, even without getting too deep into it, you can see now we have a similar theme between what Jesus is saying about Abraham seeing something of his day and the, the writer of Hebrews mentioning that these people, these, these great patriarchs of the faith, they actually saw something and greeted these issues from afar. But can we conclude exactly what Jesus is referring to? To a very specific event that made Abraham glad? I, I don't think we can. I don't think we can with 100% certainty. But I believe we can have a pretty good idea that Jesus is talking about his life and ministry, including the resurrection and its implications. Said differently, here it is. I believe that we can be fairly confident that Jesus is telling these religious leaders, get this now, that Abraham witnessed in his own day, nearly 2,000 years before Jesus would be born in a manger, that he would witness that Jesus was the Redeemer who lives. Now, this should not necessarily carry a ton of weight, but I know some of you will appreciate that I became more and more convinced of this as I began to work through the commentaries, as I do with pretty much all of my sermon prep. And virtually every commentator that I went to said the same thing, held to this view that Abraham actually saw something specific in the life of Jesus. I actually found no commentator that didn't see it this way. MacArthur, and I quote, Abraham saw his son Isaac, the be in his son Isaac, the beginning of God's fulfillment of his covenant with him. Wearsby, and I quote, certainly Abraham saw the birth of the Messiah and the miracul miraculous birth of his own son Isaac, and he certainly saw Calvary when he offered Isaac to God. Uh, Wolvert and, and Zuck, the great professors out of Dallas Theological Seminary. They, they say, and I quote, how much of the messianic times God revealed to his friend Abraham is unknown, but it is clear that he knew of the coming salvation and he rejoiced in knowing about it and expecting it. And if this whole issue is still a little bit foggy, I think it'll become a bit more clear as we go on to question number two. Question two, during what period of, li of Abraham's life could Jesus be referring to? Abraham led a, a profound and amazing life. He lived 175 years. Uh, Abraham was ignorant of God's existence when one day, no doubt, in a miraculous fashion, God came to Abraham and told him to get up, pack up his house, and leave where he was living, a, a place called Ur. And he was taken by God some years later uh, before the heavenlies, and he was told that his descendants would be as great as the expanse of the stars that were before him. He watched God intervene time and again in powerful, miraculous ways. But in the whole of Abraham's storied life, there is arguably but one incident that serves as a picture of an aspect of our Savior's ministry. 
And that event is the account of Abraham offering his son Isaac on the altar. This incident is found in Genesis 22. Uh, For some, uh, it, it is a familiar story. Here it is. God comes to Abraham with a powerful and difficult assignment. We read about this assignment in Genesis 22, verse two. He said, God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I I will tell you. Abraham is to take and sacrifice his son on a mountain that's a three days journey away. It must have been a terrible struggle for Abraham that evening as he wrestled with God's command. But it, but it seems as though sometime during the night, Abraham worked the problem through. Now let's just think about this for a moment. God, God has told Abraham that through Isaac, he would be the father of a great nation. Isaac has had no children at this point. So if God was telling Abraham to take his son's life, then the God who had done a miracle in Isaac's birth was going to have to do a miracle in Isaac's death. In other words, there was going to have to be some sort of a resurrection. And we know that this was something that Abraham was thinking because he fully expected to bring Isaac back down the mountain uh, after uh, the sacrifice. As Abraham and and Isaac uh, and the servants, they neared the final destination, we read in Genesis 22, verse five. Then Abraham said to his young men, these servants, stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship, and then we will come again to you. That's not all the evidence that we have that Abraham was expecting some sort of a resurrection. This too is the clear teaching of the book of Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Watch carefully. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now watch, he, Abraham, considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did. He did receive him back, without question then. We know that Abraham believed that God was going to do a miracle, and this miracle involved bringing Isaac back from the dead. Uh, Precisely, the miracle that God the Father did with his son, Jesus. And, and, and these verses in Hebrews help us actually connect the dots in this way. But, but even with that, let's go back to Abraham. I mean, the tension must have been building inside of him, uh, and we can only imagine how great this was as he began to get closer and closer to the point of having to offer up his son, Isaac. But, it, but as Abraham... He lifts up his hand, holding the knife we read back in Genesis 22. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Can you just try to imagine what Abraham is feeling at this very moment? Relief for sure, no question about it. And I see him being very glad at this point. He's, he's joyful. But there's even more here in, in Genesis 22 to help us understand Abraham's seeing of something in Jesus' day. When the trial was over, God provided a ram for a sacrifice uh, in, place, in place of Isaac. We read about that in verse 14. Uh, so Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, or in the Hebrew, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. 
It's an interesting phrase, this Jehovah Jireh. It, it means the Lord will provide. It does not mean the Lord did provide. This is important. In other words, the name does not simply memorialize a past event. It actually anticipates a, a future action. And likewise, there is a statement at the end of verse 14. Can we go back to it again? So Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. Now watch. On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. There is clearly a prophetic word here. And I want to be careful not to overstate. But it makes a lot of sense that this statement is a prophetic word about a place that we call Calvary, where God did not spare his, his own son. And very interestingly, some archaeologists believe that Mount Moriah came to be the very spot where Jesus was crucified. And, and we know as a point of archaeological fact that it was at least close to the spot of the very crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That brings us to our final question. Question number three. How can Abraham's reaction be an example for us today? If we're seeing this accurately, if Abraham's seeing of Jesus' day included some anticipation of the resurrection, we know it wasn't the only Old Testament reference to this glorious event. And as far as I know, and I may not know with perfect knowledge, that the next prophetic word about the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is found in the book of Job. Let's go there. In Job 19, we read, for I know that, and this is Job speaking, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. I have read those words all week long. I hear joy in those words. I hear gladness in those words. And they come after uh, Job's loss of his possessions, his family, and the insensitive and even cruel uh, interventions uh, of his friends. As a matter of fact, uh, Job 19, it begins this way, starting in verse two. How long will you torment me, speaking of his friends? How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These 10 times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed? To wrong me, when Job turned to the past, he had nothing but remembrance of great loss. And when he turned to his friends, just grief. But what about the future? What of the Lord? When he turned in this direction, he had the joy and the knowledge of a future redeemer. And this thought excited Job so much that he actually prefaces his words about the Redeemer living with the wish that his thoughts actually might be preserved. Let's take a look at those. Right before saying, I know my Redeemer lives, Job says this, oh, that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, oh, that with an iron pen and lead, that they were engraved in the rock forever. Job was so glad about the truth that Jesus lives that he wanted his testimony of faith to be written down and kept forever. And so it was. It was preserved in the scriptures. Uh, there's also the experience of gladness by those who were actually there surrounding those times and places where the resurrection took place. Like Job, the early followers of Jesus had their grief too. I mean, they loved Jesus, and they looked to him to be, the, to be the Messiah, and now he was gone. He was crucified. The women who came to the grave early that first Easter morning, they were far from thinking that God had raised Jesus from the dead. In actual fact, they were grief-stricken to find that the, that the body was missing, actually read about Mary's report to Peter in John 20, uh, verses 20, uh, uh, verse 2 rather. 
Uh, They have taken the, the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Grief, uh, sadness. Uh, the two Emmaus disciples were no better when Jesus later appeared to these two individuals on this road. Uh, he asked uh, the cause of their distress and they could only reply, and we read about it in Luke tra- chapter 24, uh, beginning in verse 20. Uh, our chief priests and rulers, they delivered him, Jesus, up to be condemned to death and, and crucified him. Now watch. But, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. More grief, more sadness. And then, of course, there's, there's Thomas. Thomas, he was one of the last ones to see Jesus resurrected. And he expressed his grief actually in outright unbelief Uh, John records it for us in John 20, verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Thomas, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. None of these, Mary, the Emmaus disciples, Thomas, none of them were expecting a resurrection. But suddenly, Jesus was among them. He was speaking their names, explaining the scriptures, inviting them to stretch out their hands and touch his hands and his side. Their their redeemer lived and they, they were absolutely overwhelmed with joy. They were glad. I imagine much like Abraham was and like Job experienced. John's gospel says in in John 20, verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Luke's gospel ends with the Lord's ascension uh, to heaven from the mountain of olives And, and it's interesting what we read here in Luke 24, beginning in verse 51. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. I bet these also sounded a bit like Abraham who was glad when he saw Jesus' day. So what about you? Jesus was victorious over death and in resurrection, resurrecting, he made that victory over death available to all who are joined to him. It's an incredible promise. And what a privilege to take our place with Abraham, Job, and the others who rejoiced, who rejoiced in the truth and the victory of the resurrection. One day, we too will experience a resurrection and be with our Lord in eternity. And until then, I want to encourage you to remember that our Redeemer is alive and he is near. He is not practicing any kind of social distance. He never has and he never will. God bless you. Let's pray. Well, Father, I thank you for the incredible promise that because our Lord resurrected He defeated death and he defeated it on our behalf as well. That those who put their faith in him will one day, one day be resurrected as well. And we will all be together in heaven and glory, worshiping you. Uh, A day that'll be so far different from what we're presently experiencing. We look forward to that day. I pray that all of us as we work our way through this difficult season, we'll remember the truth that our Redeemer lives. And in remembering it, it would bring us much needed comfort and joy. God bless. It's in Jesus' name I pray all this. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for Easter services uh, online. We want to remind you that you can give online through our website or our app. 
and we are thankful for the many of you that have have been uh, generous through this time as you're able. Uh, we also have something a little bit different for ending our services today. Usually for Easter, we have the full worship team, you know, with all the singers, uh, we, and we love uh, doing that together with you, uh, the SEC congregation. Uh, obviously not able to do that at this point, even though we, uh, we were able to have a, a band for earlier in the service today. Uh, but we put something together with the worship ministry that we want to share with you to end services with today, a little treat for you. Um, uh, a song that we did all from our homes uh, to bless you, uh, the Waymaker is what it's called. Uh, we hope you're blessed by it today, and happy Easter. We will see you next Sunday. Bye. <laughs> Even when